thank you, Julie, for joining us and for your willingness to be our first person this morning. Thank you so much for that. We have a, a really I, nice audience here for you today. I see. We, mm -hmm. um, you have so much to share. We have a really short hour, so we'll get started right away. World War II began with Germany and Russians, Russia's invasion of Poland in September 1942. When you were born in April 1941, the city where your family lived was under Soviet occupation. I know you know very little about your family and their lives prior to your birth, but maybe we can start with a little bit to the extent that you know about your family in the time before your birth. When the Nazis came, uh, they kicked out my grandfather and grandmother from their home and moved them into the ghetto, did the same thing with my parents. My grandfather and my father built a special compartment in a barn in the ghetto, and that's where <clears throat> My mother, my father, and I were hiding. My grandfather left to visit friends, and he got taken, and he was taken to his first concentration camp. Then... Um, Julie, before we go on about the ghetto, maybe just a couple of questions before sure. that. You lost your parents very young. What do you know about them? What I know is that my mother had a very, very pretty voice. Mm -hmm. I remember the sound of her voice singing me lullabies. And I remember that because I remember asking Lucia, who was my aunt, to sing to me. And she had this horrible, croaking voice. <laughs> and she had a wonderful heart, but she could swear in every language. <laughs> Couldn't read or write in any. But a very, very courageous woman. And by the way, her name is amongst the righteous amongst nations. If you look under Poland, you will see Lucia Nowitzki Eisen. Julie, you shared to me, as you just did, that your, your mother had this beautiful voice that even today there are certain songs that when you hear them, they evoke the feelings and, and memories of your mother. There is one, and I can't even pronounce it, Often, Papa Dick, it's a lullaby that my mother used to sing to me. And when I hear that, I have recollections, brief ones, of my mother who felt soft and smelled milky. Because while we were in hiding, she gave birth to my baby sister. Julie, um, Nazi Germany turned on the Soviet Union in June 1941, uh, just months after you were born. Within days, the city of Lvov was occupied by the Nazis, and your family, as you began to tell us, was forced into the ghetto. Tell us more about that. You've explained that th your father and your grandfather had built this, this hiding place inside the ghetto. Tell us more what you know about the, your life in the ghetto. Now, what I tell you about my life in the ghetto is mainly from my grandfather, right, right. his diary, because I have no memory except little tiny vignettes, and those are moments of real fear. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember certain smells the iron smell of blood, the, um, the stench of dead bodies, mm -hmm. 
that were all over the ghetto because people were dying at a very, very rapid pace. And there was nowhere to bury anyone. So that was pretty awful. Your, your father, your, excuse me, your grandfather was taken by the Nazis to Janowska, a forced labor camp where thousands of Jews were killed. How did your grandfather end up in Janowska? He went to visit friends again yeah. who had no secret bunker, nothing. And all of them were taken. And they were taken to Klopperoff Station. And that's where the Nazi commander of Janowska would stand and put people in two lines. To the right were those who were in any way frail, old people like me. And children who were too young to work, mm -hmm. women who were pregnant, and people who had no special trade. In other words, uh, they saved women who could sew Nazi uniforms. Uh, they saved musicians, because one of the commandants loved to hear this music as people were marched to the back to be shot and killed. This was a pretty awful place. This camp was one of the biggest in Poland and was known as the Harvard of concentration camps. Commandants were sent here to learn how to kill and torture. One man, again, this is for my grandfather, who was a commander, Wilhaus was his name, would stand on the balcony, and if he didn't like the way your Jewish star was sewn on your jacket or your pants, he shot you in the head. So it was a pretty brutal place. Tell us what your, your grandfather was, because he was a very strong man from what you know, he was selected to do very hard labor. Um, what was he made to do? He, to cut stones mm -hmm. and then haul them. And he was at one point very severely um, punished for some infraction. The infraction was he dared to tell the commandant that the bugs could fit at most eight men, but not 16. And for this, he was beaten black and blue uh, by the commandant. And it was his fellow prisoners who got wet rags and put them on him at night. And so to ease the bruising that he got. And the next morning when he dragged himself to the head count, the commandant said, you, you pig, I didn't expect you to live, but it's all right, I'll get you. And your grandfather, just amazingly, was actually able to escape from Yanowska. How did he manage that? He was told that he would be, he'd gotten very weak mm -hmm. and he'd lost a lot of weight. And he was told that he, by one of the Jewish honchos, that he would be shot the next day. And there's a song that's much older than all of you here. Janis Joplin sang it. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And in fact, what else did he have to lose? So he decided he would run away. As the guards were letting in new prisoners, he ran his work was at the top of the mountain. Janowska was on a mountain. Well, a hill, sorry, a hill. 
and he took off and the new prisoners were being brought in. So he managed to run down uh, the hillside and crossed Yadowska Street. And then he jumped because there was a huge- Like a ravine, right? Ravine, mm -hmm. thank you. And at the bottom of that ravine was a railroad track. And he, as he got to the other side, a railroad came by, and that railroad was carrying ammunition. And so the Nazis didn't dare shoot, because what would happen if you shot at an ammunition train? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Yes, it would blow up, right. And, uh, you know, ammunition was precious. So my grandfather had this wound on his hand, a thin concentration camp uniform, cotton, and bare feet because he was 6'2", 250, well, much less then. And his feet were very large. And Prisoners had their clothing taken away when they came into the concentration camp and were issued the uniform and wooden shoes. And his feet were too big. He couldn't wear wooden shoes, so he was barefoot. Now, this was the end of November in Poland. Very cold, snowing. Well... He was, at this point, both hot and cold. Hot because of the, the hand, had, yeah. and cold because he was physically cold. So he alternated. And he went to the home of a Polish small farmer, or a peasant, Mr. Bereski. And Mr. Bereski helped save his life. He fixed his hand, cleaned it, and put mercurochrome on it, gave him food, and let him clean up, and put on warm clothes, and wrapped his feet in rags. And the next day, he took him uh, with a shovel to a very large woods nearby, the Borshevitsky Forest. And that's where my grandfather dug a ditch to hide himself from the elements, but also from the Nazis. Now, <clears throat> as he was hiding there, one day he heard people talking, three men, and they were speaking Yiddish. And he went out very, very ecstatic. And they were going to shoot him because they didn't know who he was. And he said, stop in Yiddish. I'm a Jew. And they said, oh. And then those men came and people came from all kinds of little towns all around <clears throat> to escape being taken off to various camps. And <clears throat> they made <clears throat> the bunker much bigger. And the, my very first memory is actually of that bunker. That I can visualize. But remember, I was almost three. So I remember it with the eyes of a child. And Then eventually he found out that the Nazis planned to burn the ghetto. And of course, my mother, my father, my baby sister was born there, and that's where we were still hiding. I'm gonna stop you for a second. So while you're still hiding in your grandfather's hiding in the woods and, and being joined by others up to up to 30 individuals eventually 
your mother gave birth while hiding in the, get, in the ghetto. That must have been extremely difficult. I can't imagine how she did that. Typhoid was rampant. Dead bodies were everywhere. Mm -hmm. There was no medicine, no food, no nothing. I, I, I marvel, marvel at her being able to do that. So that with the Nazi intent to destroy the ghetto, your grandfather learns about it and decides he has to come and try and save his family. And so now one thing you need to know is that <clears throat> the men had one gun. And since my grandfather had had a lot of experience in World War I, he became the kind of leader and the men <clears throat> would go out at night and they would shoot the tires of Nazi munitions trucks and take out anything, guns, bullets, grenades, uniforms, everything they could get. They would also rob the depots of Ukrainian complicitory police and would take any kind of food, water, back to the tunnel. So your grandfather, what, what does he do then when he realizes he's got to get to you? So he makes his way into the ghetto. So he asks for volunteers. <clears throat> he takes um, a Nazi command car. That they had, they had taken, stolen from the Nazis. In of, of course. Their, in one of their raids. Yeah. Yes, okay. in one of the raids they had stolen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he asked for volunteers, all the men volunteered, and he said no. Uh, he would take four, and he had them wait in a nearby woods, and he decided to go to the ghetto himself, because he knew exactly where we were. So he came and got my mother, my father, my baby sister, and me out, and... I always felt very, very special about my grandfather. We were very, very close. <clears throat> and the first word I said was Jaju, which is grandpa, and not mommy. My mother was not happy, but she kind of went with the flow. But my grandfather and I were just a team. That's all there was to it. And anyway, I remember him as always very, very special. One day, <clears throat> oh, do you want to hear about that tunnel where we were? Yes, hidden? we would like to hear about the tunnel. Yes. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Very much. Where we were hidden in the woods. <clears throat> now, remember. I was almost three. I remember that it was cold and damp mud on the walls. I remember a very tall ladder, wooden ladder, to get in. It was probably no more than six feet, but to me it seemed very tall. And I remember walking around and feeling these mud walls and going, exploring my way to the end of that particular room. And at the end of it was a, splint, a splintery wooden table. And I remember just touching it and then not touching it anymore. But there was a candle, a fat candle, sitting on top of this round table, and that was the only light. Julie, at, at some point, um, oh, one other question. Were there other children in, in the group in the tunnel? There were two teenage girls. Two teenage girls. Uh-huh, and they, um, they, they being in the tunnel were, of course, betrayed. Right. Yeah. 
it, before we come back to that, um, at some point your grandfather made a very tough decision, and that was to take you and your sister out of the hiding place in the, in the tunnel and to take you hiding elsewhere where you ended up with Lucia. Tell us what you can about why he took you out and then about his return to the bunker, which you began to tell us about. He took us out because my baby sister cried a lot. Mm -hmm. She's an infant. I tried to cry, but my, grand my father could say, hush, and I hushed. But how do you stop a five-month-old baby from crying? My mother <clears throat> would put her hand over her mouth, and <clears throat> people were afraid that, well, my grandfather was afraid that my mother would smother Tola. So he decided he had to take us out. And, <clears throat> and Tola was my baby. Um, you know, some people have dolls. I had my baby. Mm -hmm. And so I guess he took me out so that I wouldn't feel so lonely and also for safety. Well, he took us to the central market of Lvov. He was dressed as a poor Polish peasant. And <clears throat> he went to the market and looked for Dr. Grohr, who was a professor of pediatrics and a pediatrician, and he ran a Catholic children's home but he could not find him anywhere. And he was desperate. So he talks in his diary about <clears throat> leaving us, wanting to just leave us there. He was our grandfather, so to him we were cute. And he would just leave us there and somebody would take care of us. And if he lived after the war, he would come and get us. And just as he was about to do that, he met Lucia Nowitzka, who had been a neighbor of his. She was a Polish Catholic woman who had lost her husband in one of the mass reprisals that the Nazis did <clears throat> and couldn't find him anywhere. And now was working, he said, Lucia, and she was shocked to see him alive. And but very happy, and he said, can you take my granddaughters and save their lives? And she said, I no longer have my own home. I work as a live-in housekeeper to a retired Polish engineer and his wife. So I would have to ask her. Now this couple <clears throat> were members of a po political party that was very anti-Semitic. So uh, my grandpa and Lucia made up a story and Isaac Eisen Jew became Stanislav Nowitzki, Polish, Catholic, 6'2", two something, and took the picture identity papers of Stanislav Nowitzki and a copy of the marriage license. And we, my baby sister and I, were supposedly Lucia's dead sister's children. Her sister lived in a small nearby town and had supposedly died. And Lucia had to take care of the two children. <clears throat> my sister and me. And Mrs. Schwarzinski said, yeah, you can have them as long as you get your work done, sure. So we went and that was my third hiding place. And what was interesting about this hiding place was the home of the Schwarzinskis was right next to the home of the Nazi governor of Lvov. So there were Nazi soldiers all over the place. 
So when you talk about being hidden in plain sight, that was me. And yet, and yet, um, even there, it wasn't long before Lucia herself was in trouble and arrested. Tell us a little bit about that. A woman down the street <laughs> told the Gestapo that Lucia Novitska, housekeeper to the Shrachinskys, was harboring Jewish children. So she was taken away for questioning, which of course meant torture. So she would admit. Well, and while she was gone, Mrs. Shrachinsky couldn't cope with a six-month-old baby. So uh, Mr. Schwarzenski, who was a friend of Dr. Groers, wrote a letter to Dr. Groers. Who ran the Catholic orphanage. Who right? ran the Catholic orphanage. And Tola Weinstock, Jewish child, became Antonina Novitska, Catholic child, and was put in this Catholic home. And my grandfather paid for three months in advance thinking, ah, at least we'll be, I, I can save one somebody from my family. And meanwhile, I was, I don't know if you remember the picture of my grandparents with a little dog that was furry, that was little fox, uh, that was little um, Rexy. Rexy was named after the dog that the Schwarzinskys owned, who was a huge German shepherd and vicious. A matter of fact, that, cow, that dog never came into the house. He had his own house, and he was fed with a long pole that would push his dish of food and of water towards him. Well. I was now three. It was boring, all these adults all over the place. My baby sister was now, my baby was gone. I kept hearing that the doctor had to take her to a hospital, and when she was all better, she'd come back. But nobody ever told me when she'd come back. So I decided, well, <clears throat> I'm going to approach this dog, who was Rex. And Lucia saw this and was about to scream. Well, Mrs. Schwarzinski said, Lucia, you don't want to scare the dog or startle the dog in any way. This dog has already taken a part of a Nazi leg. And so, Lucia was quiet, and I went up to the dog, and I started petting him. And then he started licking me, and licking me, and I got up on his back, <laughs> and I was riding around on him, and that made me very happy. And so, now, my job was to take Rex and put him under the kitchen table with a long tablecloth and keep him calm if any Nazis stepped into the house. And it was only when I became an old adult that it occurred to me, who were they trying to save, the dog or me? And I still don't know, <laughs> you know? Julie, you, you mentioned Lucia and, 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 and Rex. Lucia, who had been taken away by the Gestapo, was able to, to um, she was released. And, and tell us, and so she came back to Charchinsky's house with you. Um, how was she released? Um, my grandfather went to Mrs. Schwarzinski and asked her to intercede with her husband because Lucia was a great cook 
and she would make food for the governor's wife and for the governor, and so they liked her. Plus, she believed the story that you were her. Oh yes, you were her nieces. Yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So she yeah. interceded because of her connections and right. brought you back. So with with Tola in the orphanage, you with Lucia and Mrs. Charfsinski, your grandfather returns to the forest. This was <clears throat> my birthday was in April. And I used to wonder why people got teary-eyed at my birthday. I mean, gee, doesn't make you feel very special when people start crying on your birthday. Well, it turns out that my grandfather returned to the tunnel to see how everybody was. And he found that the opening was disturbed. And he thought, well, maybe our own grenades blew up or something. And then he noticed that every single body had bullet holes. So he realized that everyone was dead. They had been shot. He found out later from the underground that a man in that tunnel trusted a Ukrainian peasant because the Ukrainian peasant claimed he was a communist. Now the Nazis hated communists and vice versa. So they thought he would be trustworthy, but he went to the Nazis and for a handful of money and a bottle of vodka. He said, I know where Jews are hiding. Let me take you to them. So that's where 30 some people, all Jews, were shot, including these two teenage girls. And your mother and father. And my mother and father. And so my parents lie, birth parents, in an unmarked grave somewhere in this huge forest. And I went trucking after, trying to find all kinds of big depressions. And yeah, I found lots of depressions, but. So what did your grandfather do then? Yeah. Then he said the prayer over the dead. He buried everyone. And in June of 44, the Russians came and liberated us. And then we moved from one DP camp to another. Before you, before you go on to the DP camp, so your grandfather came back in the, in the summer of 1944, the Soviets liberated you. So what your, your grandfather returned to get you um, after the war and to try to also get Tola, what, what happened? He found out that the roof of that Catholic home had been bombed, and so the children were moved to another site, I can't remember the name, in Poland. So he went there and found out that that place was evacuated and that 80 children were <clears throat> divided into two groups, and one group and the nuns went to Western Europe, and another group went to Hungary. And at that time, Hungary was a bad place to go to because it was like a trap. You couldn't get out. So he went everywhere left me with Babsha while he was looking for my with, sister. He left you with Lucia? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And couldn't find my sister. And then the Red Cross. When I was at the children's home, I got a picture from the Red Cross. When you were at the children's home in Cleveland. In Cleveland, in Cleveland yeah. yes. And it was about that, that big little, black and white, and it was a picture of a girl who looked a 
couple years younger than I, and <clears throat> had light-colored eyes, and a great big white bow in her hair, like that. And the Red Cross thought this was my sister. And I was ecstatic. I had somebody. I had a sister. And then my social worker at the children's home took me to Hannah House, part of University Hospital, for a blood test. Two weeks later, she called me into her office and she said, Julia, I'm very sorry. This child is not your sister. The blood doesn't match. And I remember I was pretty devastated at that point and I decided I don't want to deal with another loss. I just can't. So I remember I just took that picture and put it away and just tried not to think about it. After, after liberation um, and, and realizing that Tola was gone, um, it was your grandfather and you, and of course there was Lucia had, who had been willing to and had taken care of you during that time. Tell us about your grandfather and Lucia. My grandfather had suffered from lots of beatings. So he had a heart issue and his legs were very, very swollen. So he was put in a hospital in the Alps and Lucia would take me by those chairs, you know, that go on Like a gondola? Like, yes, yeah, like a gondola. kind okay. of like yeah. that, but it's an individual seat. Okay. And Babsha took me on her lap and almost smothered me because she was afraid I'd fall. And we would go visit Jaju at his hospital. And he describes in his diary that he had electric shock treatments. Mm -hmm. Well, who gets electric shock treatments for heart problems? So I think he had some problems after the war. Mm -hmm. And I would not be surprised if he were very, very much into a depression. I mean, he had to bury his own child and his son was gone and missing. And he had two grandsons who were older than me, and they all were with, killed. With all the losses that he experienced, in 1948, you were seven, your grandfather sent you to the United States. Um, what, we tell us were about that. living in a DP camp. Which you is displaced know. persons camp. Yeah. Yes, but you can call it delayed pilgrims. I like to think of us as delayed pilgrims. Anyway, so we, yeah. So they sent you to the United States. And the reason was that the uh, DP camp we were in was very primitive. It was the largest of the three around Linz and didn't have enough food, didn't have enough anything. So we had scarcity of wood or coal or anything. And we had, each family got one room in a wooden barrack. And then you got the stove if you could find something to heat it with and you had water outside. Fortunately, our barrack was the one that had the faucet for water. So you could get the water and take it in, and if you had coal or something, you could heat the water. 
It was very, very primitive. And he was afraid that I would have absolutely no future. And it was very difficult to get a visa to come to the United States, especially from Eastern Europe. But there was an exception. If you were an orphan born between certain years, you could go on an orphan's visa. So I went, he sent me on an orphan's visa, the youngest of a group of girls by five years, on a boat that took forever to come to America. And I remember that was a very tough journey for me. For one thing, since I was the youngest, we had hammocks to sleep on, and they were four. And because I was the youngest, I always got the bottom one. And that meant I saw all this swinging. And it really makes you seasick, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was not a happy camper. Um, then I remember I had a toothache and I went to one of the nuns and she gave me oil of cloves. Well, I smelled of oil of cloves, but it didn't do anything for my toothache. But... Julie, you're um, in the DP camp, it was you and Lucia and gran your grandfather, so your grandfather and Lucia decided to become a family. Yes, my grandfather wanted to pay Lucia everything he had. Um, and he had made some money at this point. And she said, no, we're a family. And I want to stay a family. So uh, grandpa said, well, then you'll have to convert to Judaism. The rabbi said, yeah, OK, but she has to shave her head. So she could go into a mikvah and have every part of her be purified. So she was a bit of a feisty lady, Lucia. And she said, Isaac, look, I have so little hair to begin with. I don't want to remove my hair. So Isaac could look pretty menacing. He, never, he didn't do anything, but he could look big. And, and he went to the little tiny rabbi and he said, Rabbi, Lucia is a good person. She's a wonderful person. We should be honored that she wants to become a Jew. And I know I feel honored because this wonderful person wants to become a Jew. And she, Rabbi, she doesn't want to cut her hair or shave her head. The rabbi said, okay, Isaac, she won't shave her head. So that was solved. And, um, <laughs> and eventually they, they emigrated to the United States as well in the early 1950s, I believe. Julie, we have time to turn to our audience for a couple of questions, but before we do, one more question for you. To this day, to this day, you still hold on to hope that Tola is out there somewhere. And you continue the search. Yes. Because I've as an tried. infant, as an infant, she could have gone anywhere. Anywhere, right. that's right. right. And Well, do you want to take a couple of questions? We have sure. time for two or three, sure. I think. Sure. We have microphones in the aisles, and we ask, if you have a question, go to the microphone. Make your question as brief as you can, if you will. I'll repeat it just to make sure we hear it right, and then Julie will respond to your question. So um, if you don't have questions, I'm hoping somebody will. I got plenty. So um, while we're waiting to see if somebody comes up, 
how did, um, what you've mentioned several times, Julie, your grandfather's diary. How did, how did, how did you come into that or tell us about he, it? When he came to America, he started writing about his wartime experiences. Mm -hmm. And for our son's bar mitzvah, we had it translated. And so. Yeah. The, another question I'd like to ask you is, you came to the United States, you went to Cleveland, you were in a children's home in Cleveland for, for a number of years. And then at age 16, you were adopted. What was that like for you? I feel I was the luckiest person in the whole world. Mm -hmm. How many people get to pick their parents? <coughs> I adored them. And I had wonderful, wonderful parents. They were German Jews. They had no children of their own. And they were unbelievably brave to adopt a teenager one who they wanted to play Mozart in the convertible when they were driving me to Washington to see the monuments and all that. I put a pillow over my head. I'm not listening to this. So I wasn't your easiest person. But I have to say, they were absolutely magnificent. And I am so, so grateful I had such fabulous luck. They were fabulous. Then my husband, pretty fabulous too. <laughs> and your grandkids. And, and my grandkids. <laughs> we, we, have a, oh. we, we have a question oh. over here, and I think we one or two questions, and we'll close the program. Thank you for being here today and, and sharing with us. My question is, after being experiencing this today and hearing your story, what wisdom could you give us about how you feel about humanity? You've seen the worst, you've seen the best. How do you, what can you share with us about the wisdom, what wisdom can you give us about humanity? How did you take what you saw and continue to live and be positive. Is there anything you can share with us? You got the gist of I, that. Does that make yes, sense? Okay. I did. Yes. I can try. It may not be wisdom. I don't purport to be all that wise, although I should be. But I do believe that my experiences made me want to go into work that would prevent other children, whoever they might be, having to go through some of the pain that I did. You spent a career working with both special needs children as well as troubled youth uh, and, and uh, in the public and, education system. And I worked very much in educational equity um, making sure, or trying to, that there is an even playing field of opportunity, because often there isn't. I'm going to turn back to Julie in just a moment to close our program. I want to thank you all for being with us today. Remi remind you that we, we have programs every Wednesday and Thursday until um, early August. Our programs through June 6 will all be live streamed but all of our programs are recorded and will be available on the museum's YouTube page. So if you can't come back and join us in person this year, uh, there are plenty of opportunities to see some of our other programs. Um, and then maybe you can come back next year when we resume in 2020. It's our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. So with that, I'd like to hmm. turn back to Julie to close today's program. If I give advice, it would be don't ignore injustice. Take a stand. 
because your silence condones the act of injustice. Yes, sir. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. Bless you. Well, thank you. Um, the other thing is, if you all see bullying, and you will if you haven't. Don't jump into and aggravate a fight by getting into a conflict cycle. But make a point of befriending the person who's being picked on. Now that's very, very, very hard to do because your friends will say, ugh, I'm not going to associate with you because you're associating. But this is where your individual strength comes in. And this is where the real you comes out. Because it's not your friends. It's you looking in the mirror every day where you need to take a stand. And that stand is standing up for someone. And I know what I really like about today's generation is that you're gutsy people. <laughs> and I love that. Thank you very much. Thank you.